Hello everyone and welcome to HR Options webinar series. My name is Amy Julian and I'm the Vice President here at HR Options. It's my pleasure to be your moderator for today's session about the intriguing topic of unlimited PTO. Now, our speaker, Janine DeBacher, is going to discuss with us why unlimited is not the correct adjective that we should use. But before we get started and dive into all of that content, I have some housekeeping information I want to go over with you so you can better interact with us during this hour. You're welcome to submit questions throughout the session by typing them into the Q&A box on your screen. We're going to respond to all the questions at the end of the session. If you're looking for the Certificate for Continuing Education credits, or if you would like to print out the slide deck to take notes on, those are located in the Resources window on the middle right side of your screen. Um, in that resources box, you're also going to find documents that Janine has shared related to no accrual policies. Janine also writes a fabulous California employment law blog, and there's a URL in that resources box that you can click on so that you can follow her posts. If you'd like to contact me um, to discuss about any HR support or outsourced employment needs that your company has, you can use the Contact Me widget at the bottom of the screen. And lastly, there's an evaluation that's going to pop up at the end of the session. We would appreciate it um, a lot if you could just take three minutes to respond to those questions. They're just um, six questions. They go really quick. HR Options hosts these webinars because we truly believe in value-added services, and we pick topics that are of interest to our contacts. You can suggest the topics that are of interest to you in our evaluation. HR Options offers outsourced HR support on a part-time and project basis. We also offer outsourced employment services throughout all 50 states and Canada. We employ the staff that our clients don't want on their payroll, and typically those are contingent workers. We also offer recruiting services, leave administration, and online harassment prevention training. And you can check out all the resources, um, all, all of the services we offer in the resources box to learn more. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you my talented colleague, Janine DeBacher. She is an employment attorney and partner with McFarland Sprinkles and Thomas, LLP, here in the Silicon Valley. Janine has worked with HR Options and with me for well over 10 years now on employee relations and compliance issues that arise. And for me, she's the attorney you want to partner with to stay out of trouble or the person that you go to when trouble's already um, a brewing. So it's great to have you with us here today, Janine, and I'm going to turn it over to you now. Great. Thank you, Amy. Um, so my name is Janine DeBacher, and I uh, am pretty fantastic with my PowerPoint uh, slides here, but uh, that's my first joke. Um, last night, I had a pretty late softball game. When you have to share softball fields, sometimes you, as an adult, you get the 9 o'clock game. And I was talking to my teammates, one of whom is in the same business as we are all are in, which is HR. And I said, oh, I was going to do this webinar tomorrow on unlimited time off. And I forgot that, that uh, uh, she's very sarcastic. And so she said, okay, well, I'm going to take as much time as, as I could possibly can, and, and you cannot punish me for it. And I said, that's exactly the point. I was trying to think of a better way to clarify, but we get so many people who say unlimited time off, and so I titled it that. And then as, as Amy said, it's really – that's a total danger uh, to call it unlimited time off because um, – what is it? It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very exciting word, unlimited. It reminds me of um, uh, Edron James. Of he when he joined the Colts. This is a football player. This must have been 15 years ago. And they had um, – I don't know if they still do it, but they have voluntary mini camps. When you're drafted, you can go to this voluntary mini camp. And then later on, they have the true training sessions. And he didn't go to the voluntary mini camp. He was drafted in the top 10 of the, of the athletes from college. And he went, I think he was boating out on, the, on Biscayne Bay or something. And uh, 
all the the people were very upset with him. All the sports writers thought that that showed he didn't have grit and commitment and all those great things that these people who have never played a sport like to like to say about the people who do. And uh, this is just so ridiculous. And and so he said, you know, I I know I only went to like the University of Miami or something, which many of you scoff at, but I know what the word voluntary means. And that means I don't have to go. And similarly, this concept of I know what unlimited means, it means unlimited. I don't have to, you can't limit me. So we like to rephrase it. And the quick and easy way to rephrase it is the no accrual time off. Um, Or if you have some other clever way to say it so long as you don't have those those key words of unlimited or um, uh, no limits or complete freedom um, that would be a, a better bet so that's why I have my my fancy PowerPoint I was able to strike through that but that's what I'm going to talk about today and the the first part that I'm going to talk about you kind of have to lay the foundation which many of you know but I You know, I I can't repeat enough that even if you know this like the back of your hand, it's always good to get refreshers on the basics of California law and always start back at the beginning um, because of things when you you pop into a new situation or you're taking over for a different situation or the laws have changed and it's not what you think it was from a couple years ago or uh, plaintiff's attorneys have discovered an area. Uh, My my partner just got back from a... um, the wage and hour class action uh, conference down in Los Angeles. And it's um, there's usually um, different sessions, and a lot of times there's always a session about what a plaint- for plaintiff's attorneys about what they're focusing on and what they think could be a new um, avenue to pursue. And so a couple years ago, there was a lot of excitement about suitable seating. And fortunately, the suitable seating thing has kind of um, – lost steam in some ways it only affects certain um, groups of employees anyway but um but that's kind of where we hear like what what are people interested in and so that's another reason why constantly kind of going back to the beginning and reminding yourself of what the rules are is handy because something that hasn't been a a hot spot for class actions or even um, individual one-offs with a labor commissioner might be there might be a new uh, push on it so so that, that's my little pep talk for why we why we go back. But so to talk about um, no accrual time off, and hopefully I won't say unlimited, even though now I've, it's it's like the white elephant at the front of my brain. Um, there are I'm going to talk about the time off rules that exist in California, just to lay the basis. How to implement a no accrual time off program? How to manage one? How to convert? To go um, back. <laughs> Sometimes we we want to go back, and that's totally possible. Um, And then questions that you may have. And um, as Amy said, I put in the materials um, a rough sample of a of a no accrual time off program so that you can look through as I talk at the end about how to implement it. Um, And that's just kind of the starting point document. Um, I uh, I highly recommend that you look through it and see how it fits with your company and then talk to your counsel or to your consultant, your HR consultant, to see if it's still compliant with the law once you're done. fiddling with it, for lack of a better word. And again, I think my voice is kind of a little high-pitched right now because this when you do a 9 o'clock game, you're done at 1030, but you're all amped because, of course, we totally won. Um, and so I have a lot of coffee streaming through my system right now. So I apologize. That I'll try and talk deeper. Okay. Here we go. So the basics of California time off rules that, that many people know about is that there's, there's vacation and sick leave and then the combo of PTO, paid time off. So vacation is a benefit. It's a gift from the employer. It is not required by any law in California, but it's one of those things that once you provide it, there's rules that kick in. So it's offered. If it's offered, there's there's certain rules that California requires. Um, one thing I wanted to put at, at the second bullet point is that if it's offered, that does not mean that the employees can tell you, I'm I'm taking this day off and you can't deny me because I have a crude vacation. Um, because you can still control. The employer can still, in some ways, manage time off so you don't have everybody off on the same day. So that that amount of control is still allowed. Of course, it can't be done in a discriminatory way or to, or to punish somebody. Um, you, of course, you, you can – sorry, that came out wrong. You can, you can limit people's um, time if, if you think they've been taking um, – if they're taking all the um, – prime time and somebody else you think is, should get to take that day off, you can control that. Um, 
but the basic rules are that when vacation is earned, of course, it's it's considered wages earned under California law. So it's it's um, something that the employee is entitled to, and it's earned as the work is performed. And that I, I put that in there to remind people that even when you 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 might have a policy that says, um, um, it, depending on how it's written, and that's always the key. Just a very general statement I'm about to make, but if you say we give people once they've worked here for six months, we give them a week. And then um, over time, they accrue more. And there's been cases that where someone has um, left after four months and no vacation was paid out. And if the policy isn't worded correctly, um, the labor commissioner will say, yeah, they, what you really said was at the six-month mark, that person can start using their week, but they've been accruing it this whole time. And therefore, when they left, they were entitled to a pro rata portion of that. As, as payment. So that's something to look at in your vacation policies if you haven't taken a look at that in a while. Um, and that goes to that the final bullet, which is that accrued but unused vacation is paid out at separation. It's um, Some employees use it as a way to, to have a cushion because there's no right to severance in California. So it's a way that they, they have money kind of in a bank to be paid out to them at separation. Um, it uh, it's an unfunded liability for most companies, and that's what can make it kind of dangerous because if you need to do um, a large separation of employees, a RIF, or, and that large can depend on how big you are. It could be five employees for one company, is a lot of people, and 50 for another company. But it, there's no special rule that says even though you're eliminating people's positions because you're having trouble paying people, that, that you still have to pay the accrued but unused vacation out at separation. And that's if the person voluntarily quits or if they um, are terminated. And that's if that is not paid out at separation, then we can spend hours on different webinars talking about um, the waiting time penalties that would then kick in under Labor Code 203 that provides that, that you must pay out all um, earned wages at the time of separation. And if you don't, then there is um, a full day's wage for every day it goes unpaid, up to 30 calendar days. Um, there is no, going back up to the other um, bullet point, no forfeiture is allowed. You, you can't have a use it or lose it policy when it comes to vacation. Um, you can have caps, so when people accrue a certain amount of time, um, you can say you can accrue up to X hours or X days, and after that you stop accruing. That must be a reasonable amount. Um, it used to be that we said 150% of the amount. So if somebody earned, um, here's where my math is going to be terrible. I'll, I'll be easy. If somebody earned 100 hours of vacation in a year, then you could say that you could only have in your bank 150 hours. So when the next year started and you started accruing, once you hit 150 hours, the accrual stopped. Um, I don't know how many people have 150 hours, but um, so that was the, you, that would used to be seen as reasonable. Over the past five years, it's been we have strong signals that the 200 percent is more reasonable, um, so that people aren't getting caught up in this. Um, because what we find is that people don't take their vacations or are discouraged from taking their vacations, and then their accrual stops, and so they're basically not earning compensation that was part of the bargain. So that's the basic rules about paid vacation. Okay. And then we turn to the basic rules for California paid sick leave that covers, that does, is mandated by law, covers every employer in California, covers all side employers in California. And then there's different rules about when there, there are rules there about, oh, you start accruing as of the first day of work, but you don't get to use it until the 90th day, if that's what the, the company decides, et cetera. The basics are, is that employees can use that time in increments of no less than two hours for a variety of health conditions for themselves and for their family members. Um, and then it, it's also been expanded, or it's, it's, it's originally, but you kind of have to expand your mind. You think of sick leave, but it also includes um, time off to deal with domestic violence, stalking, um, and sexual assault issues. So that, that time off is covered under paid sick leave. So it's a pretty expansive situation because it's time off to care for oneself and a family member. And then I'm sure many of you, if you're listening to this seminar, you've probably been very attentive and listened to other presentations about paid sick leave. So this is just a, a quick reminder that 
there's three ways that you can fall, you can uh, abide by the state rule. Um, the state rule for California time off. And, you know, if you're in San Francisco or Oakland or Santa Monica, there's you have your local municipality rules. So you need to be mindful of that as well. But the three options that you must satisfy, even if you're in those um, localities, are you can either do the accrual, which is the one hour for every 30 hours worked, the grant, which is annually, there's, there's just a, there is a use it or lose it thing there with a 24 hours granted each year, or if you have an existing policy, you have um, not your vacation policy, but if you have a paid time off policy that allows people to use time off for any reason, right? So that going back to you have the vacation rules, and then you traditionally before sick leave and even now, some people say, well, I don't want to have those two different um, buckets. I just want people to have paid time off, and therefore um, I don't have to police people to so I can tell if they're truly you know is that a real cough when the snow is really good on a Friday and I know this person really likes to ski but they call me up coughing are they really sick do I really have to be the policeman or um what is it uh check because the person says they have vision problems but that just means they they can't see coming to work that day um and so you know trying to have that so some companies have that paid time off and if you're paid time off is generous enough that it fits within the California time off rules, then California has said that's sufficient as well. Um, the trick with paid time off, of course, is that it's considered vacation under California law. So it's that accrued but unfunded liability that has to be paid out at separation. You can't have forfeitures. You can't only have reasonable caps, et cetera. Um, the other thing that is kind of a background note about um, um, your time off policies, is that uh, tracking is critical. Um, tracking of vacation isn't necessarily, at this point in time, mandated by law, but we do know that, again, coming out of the conferences and the writings for people who represent plaintiffs, we know that that, that tracking, because it's considered wages, um, is a focus point. Um, and I can't tell you how, how much um, more pleasant it is to go into um, a labor commissioner conference, et cetera, with very well tracked vacation time showing how it was accrued, how it was earned, and how we calculated the um, payout correctly versus a situation where, well, I've got it on this spreadsheet, but which I've transferred from this ledger. And then it, you know, I, I keep track of it every two weeks. And if someone comes in and asks me, I can tell them, which, you know, that's how some of us operate. And that's, you know, some of us have the brains and that's that's the way it works and it's perfect for us. But, you know, we're all banking on someone dropping by and saying, here is, you know, $100 million, stop working. And so when that person walks away and that great timekeeping system walks out the door with, the, with that person, then it's a little sketchy. So we want it to be that anybody can pull up that tracking and accrual and know and be able to show a labor commissioner very easily how much time is left. And then tracking for um, for paid sick leave, um, that must be tracked and um, the information about how much is accrued and how much is used must be distributed with every wage statement. And so that's either with the wage statement or on the wage statement. And sometimes that's dependent upon how much the payroll provider wants to charge for that or how much of a hassle it is, et cetera. So that is just something that has to go with the wage statement. Um, then after the California paid sick leave rules came about, a couple weeks after they took effect, there were there was an amendment. And uh, because the legislature realized there's people who have this no accrual time off. And so how, why would they have to track this paid sick leave if they're already giving their employees the freedom to take their time off to care for themselves, et cetera. So the, at the state level, California said, if you put on that, wage statement notice that either on the wage statement or along with the wage statement you put that you have a no accrual time off system um, every time to let the employee remind the employee the same thing you reminded them of two weeks ago then that could satisfy the law the issue um, for a lot of employers is if is if you have an employee in san francisco or oakland etc that rule doesn't cover that's that you're in satisfaction of california's rules but you're not satisfying san francisco's rules San Francisco 
only allows um, an accrual basis. There's no grant of paid sick leave. You have to accrue it for every hour that you work. Every 30 hours you work, you accrue one hour, and they want that to be tracked on the, and shown to the employee. And so even if, you know, even if you have a no accrual system or a, you know, 10 million hour PTO system so that, that no one's ever going to be dinged for being sick, um, you still need to show that accrual of one hour for every 30 hours worked, that, that you're satisfying that rule. It's a very much a, um, a form over substance, I think, is the way I would, is that the right way or is it substance over form? Um, but it's, you know, San Francisco, I think, has seen, has seen it all and uh, doesn't want to be um, caught up again. I just had, um, <laughs> and I'm saying that because, you write several years ago with Healthy San Francisco, which, was the, um, which is San Francisco's healthcare program, many um, entities put a surcharge on their menus. They said, for Healthy San Francisco, because of that, we're adding X percent to uh, your bill to pay into the Healthy San Francisco program. Essentially, we're saying because of Healthy San Francisco, we're adding the surcharge. And so there was um, um, a pizza place, a famous pizza um, chain in San Francisco that did that, but the money didn't go to the Healthy San Francisco. It went into the coffers of the pizza chain. And so um, San Francisco is like, we are not falling for this kind of stuff anymore, right? So we don't care that you say you have a no accrual time off program, and we don't care that that satisfies California law. You're in San Francisco. you got to satisfy our law. That's, that's what makes San Francisco great. And so you just need to be mindful of where you are. Oakland, again, Oakland, San Francisco, Santa Monica, and other um, places like that. Uh, when um, – just to throw something out that came out of that conference, the um, we we've always known that, for example, the Healthy San Francisco. If you if you um, if you open the door in San, if you if you're driving through the city on behalf of your employer and you get out to deliver some things, that time counts toward the accrual in San Francisco, and that's also for the their sick leave program. So if you have people who work in Belmont and San Francisco, and then they go up to Mendocino and they're living the high life, when they're in San Francisco, that time needs to be tracked and ready. So that all that background and all those rules and all that compliance and combined with a lot of companies that are like, we're not, we don't want to be stifled by your rules and laws and we're new and we're the new economy and we're creating, you know, social justice parking apps that are going to change the world, right? We don't want to be quiet about it. So that's why we have these no accrual programs. And that's one of the reasons these things come about. So, but I'm going to caution you as I get towards the, the end of this that that even the no accrual programs, even in, you know, as opposed to following all these rules, there's still a lot of rules to follow, and you still need to have this in the in in your background, and you need your HR team to know these basic rules because even within no accrual, you have to make sure you're complying. The other big thing that you have to comply with when you have time off, right, is you have your your pr- protected time off that is beyond vacation and sick and PTO. Once you get above 50 employees, um, you're gonna have to be mindful of the Family Medical Leave Act and the California Family Rights Act and the protected time off, right, uh, 12 weeks. Um, if the person has worked 1,250 hours in the past 12 months and has worked for your company for 12 months, and that's protected time off. And then pregnancy disability leave, I kept them all as acronyms because that makes me look smarter, but you know, Hopefully I don't flub them. And then the the big gray area of time off as an accommodation under the disability rules, both the ADA and FEHA. Um, those, those both allow time off when that's what the doctor says is going to be the accommodation needed to get this person back to work and able to perform the essential functions of their job. So even if you aren't covered by the FMLA and the CFRA yet, and even if the person isn't pregnant, if they need time off, due to some disabling condition, they might get that as an as accommodation. And so all this still needs to be in the background. So even if you convert to no accrual, you still have to sign up and attend your leave of absence um, seminars and be mindful of changes in the rules and the regs and the notices, et cetera. And so that's, this is all the background that goes in as we're, as we're talking about how to implement these programs. So the beauty of the no accrual program in theory is there's no tracking right? Except there is, if you're in San Francisco, because you still have to track those hours. Um, The the other big theory is, we're adults here. 
we don't care when people take time off. It's all great. Leave early. Um, come back late. That's, that's a very valuable uh, concept. Um, and if it works in, the, in your particular business or the group that you're, you're going to implement this for, that's true. There's, but there's that, if you've been in HR for at any time at all, you know there's that incredible balance between needing to treat people like adults and needing to be, well, like the nag in chief. <clears throat> it's, I'm, I'm the umpire in chief for my little league, but I've learned that that really means that for a lot of things, I'm just a nag in chief. Like, come on, keep the helmet on. Don't swing the bat, you know, around other little kids, that kind of stuff. Um, the thing I mentioned at the beginning, the no accrual programs, you want to be really mindful of how you, um, how you publicize it, how you write about it, how people talk about it, because unlimited, like I said, can mean unlimited. Voluntary workouts, I know what voluntary means. Um, so no accrual is a good term. Some companies have used TOP, the time off program, and then they can just use that acronym so they're not having to use anything. They say, pursuant to the top. Um, and then you still must be vigilant about employees' protected time off. Because, again, in HR, we have that balance, right, where we have to respect everyone's privacy. We can't be coming in, whoa, that's a limp. You, you know, what's wrong with you? you don't, we don't say that type of stuff in the workplace. But we need to be mindful if someone has a, is having trouble um, ambulating, for lack of a better word, and their job requires that, then we don't just fire them. We engage in the interactive process. We see if they, you know, what can we do to make it so that you are able to perform this job? So that's, you know, that's one of the things that makes HR so tough. And so I go back to my standard joke. That's why I don't actually do HR. I just judge what all of you do because that's hard, that, that balance and the tension between those things. So you have to, all these things come into play. Um, so non-accrual programs are not recommended for hourly non-exempt workers. Um, because it's not really a no accrual program. You're not going to, I can't, there's no real way to pay them. Um, you know, if, there's, if you need somebody there for eight hours and they're there for four hours and then they're like, oh, I'm going to take some no accrued time off. Well, that's called not working your full shift and you just don't get paid for it. It, it doesn't really work out. Um, it's not, it's not good for positions where it's difficult to measure productivity. It's difficult to see, um, you know, is this person performing so that you can actually have an objective view of that person as opposed to right right now, oh, one more person walks into my office wearing Dodgers gear, right? That's how I'm measuring whether that person is performing. And right now they are performing poorly because I don't want to hear any more about the Dodgers, okay? The Giants will be back. And that's that's so it gets into these subjective things as opposed to the objective. Is this person doing their job? So where it's where you, where you can measure productivity, um, law firms, associates who are billing hours, right? Well, we're measuring that you build a lot of hours. That's great. You did it, maybe you did it all in one day. Maybe you did it over the course of a week. But we're really focused on how much we bill and how much we get in revenue, and that's what's important. Um, of course, positions where staffing and coverage needs must be met, um, retail, right? We can't have people saying, I'm leaving, or I'm not coming. I, I decided not to come in. I, but, yeah, the cash register was uncovered, but that, that's okay. Um, restaurants, medical offices, physical therapist offices, all those types of things where you need someone there to assist the clients, patients, customers, et cetera. Um, positions where face-to-face -face interactions are important, and they're, this is an important thing because this is going to come into play later when we talk about managers and when you have a no accrual policy. Is it that the face-to-face -face interaction is important? Or is that just that your manager likes it that way? And does he like it? Does he or she like it that way for a real reason, as opposed to we call it work for a reason? You need to be here, and I need to see butts in the seats at 8 a.m. and all that type of stuff. So you have to kind of unpack, for to use some consultant speak, what's going on there, and whether or not face-to-face -face actions interactions are important. And um, uh, it's not recommended for. This is kind of a Employers where time off is not valued. <laughs> it's not recommended to be a gotcha for people. So, you know, my note here says um, uh, Yahoo, Marissa Mayer, right? That is not when, when she had her, her babies the first time and then she was back in the office immediately um, uh, because she could, because she had so much um, assistance and because she could control her physical location. Um, but that is a signal to the other 
people who work there and who want to succeed and, and, and grow with the company that, oh, you know how you become a CEO? You don't take time off. You, we don't value that here. We don't value personal time. We don't value um, families. Um, even if we say we do, but we don't, giving people this um, no accrual time off program is only going to further um, uh, kind of create or maintain an atmosphere where we don't want anyone to take time off. And so because it, it, it makes it even more squishy. And so it's, it's just not recommended. And it's also not recommend. I would not recommend it because I've had clients do this where they have an environment where they have accrued time off or they've all come from businesses that had accrued time off. And now nobody took time off. So they had a lot of um, payouts that they had to do at separation, et cetera. And they found that they're, they were unhappy because they never took time off or they found that their teams were unhappy because they, they didn't take off. So their solution is what we're going to do to jumpstart a value, valuing time off is we're going to put in a no accrual time off program. It, it, the, the, the putting the cart before the horse, my cliches are always wrong, but that's not what's going to kickstart it. That's going to further drive it into people not taking time off. And so, um, if you already have a, an, you have a good balance, then it will work, but it's not going to kickstart. It's going to further drive it into the ground where people don't take time off. And, um, and then it's, it's just not going to, it's not the kind of thing that gets people doing it. The ideal, it is not recommended, but if you're going to do it, you're going to do one of these programs, you do it for exempt employees where you can measure productivity. And again, the classic, the easiest example I have are law firms because your associates, um, are billing and again they can bill at 10 o'clock at night they can bill first thing in the morning but they and they can bill monday tuesday wednesday and then take thursday friday off so that's you can measure the productivity it's also ideal for exempt employees because it there's that there's a lot of tension in the wage and hour rules right we are promising the exempt employee an annual salary of let's just say a hundred thousand dollars so that's all in some ways that's it um and so if they get their work done, they get a hundred thousand dollars. And so if they take a couple of days off in January or a week off in February, we still have promised this annual salary. That's at the end of the year, their W two is going to say a hundred thousand. Now, many people, it doesn't work that way. It goes, you have your salary plus this paid vacation and that's fine too, but you could, you could do away with that fiction and just say your salary is instead of a hundred thousand plus two weeks of paid vacation, it's $112,000 and that's it. And you can take your time off where it is. And that's because that is how the exempt laws work, right? If you are truly, if that person is truly an exempt employee, then you're not supposed to be watching when they come in and watching when they leave and making them clock in and out because you're paying for results and you're not paying for what we're, what is listed on this page, the FaceTime, the servicing customers at a certain time at a certain place. And so that's why it, it, we don't do it for non-exempts. We do it, we can do it for, for exempts. And it also kind of takes us back to the, takes us back to the whole concept of an exempt employee. And in, in, in many ways, that's this, not, you know, accrual is going back to the purity of an exempt employee. The accrual programs are um, a way, it, you, it increases the money paid from employer to employee. And it also allows the employer to manage the time off because if an individual only has accrued a week, then that's all they'll be able to take. Um, but uh, it's, it takes away the concept of building up um, time that you've earned over time with the employer, et cetera. So there's a lot of different things going on here. It's, it's important to think everything through. There's no, I'm not going to say there's any right answer and that um, if you have an exempt um, a, a, a group of exempt employees and you want to implement this, I'm not going to say, you know, you're insane. I'm just going to say, okay, well, let's just be thoughtful and think through it. So looking to do this, you know, it's, it's easy if you um, start your business and on day one, you say, we're going to do a no accrual program. Okay, well, that's great. We're just going to, then we could go to the, um, I, I, I provided in the materials, my cleverly titled Acme company, time off policies. And that, that would just be your policy from day one. And you'll see um, how that you can read through to see how that works. Many times, there, when you're starting a company, you're not really thinking that through. 
and because um, you're thinking about actually starting the company. But so a lot of times we're dealing with a transition where we let people accrue and go to non-accrual. Um, or you could have the kind of company that never allowed any sort of time off, um, which again might get you in trouble in terms of the exempt rules. But um, uh, so now this is just a new policy. So if you have an existing PTO or vacation policy, you have to be careful because again, all those accrued, all that accrued time in the bank is is still accrued, and you have to. It's good to tell people you're gonna. You have to tell people you're making this change. You can't um, have it where they lose the accrued wages. You can do payouts. If people have um, if a certain amount, you could just pay that all out and then move to the no accrual policy. That's That's been permitted, um, but you have to be mindful, especially when people have, um, you know, they're, I'm planning on taking a four-week trip to Europe and I've accrued those four weeks and I'm all ready and now it's been, that's been paid out and now we're in this no accrual policy seems to be that four weeks is not is totally frowned upon. And so that's kind of changing the bargain that this employee um, had. And so this is something where it, it's a lot of work for the HR professional to do this transition. And you really want to look at what's going on with your population, who has accrued time off, um, who doesn't, how are they going to, how is this going to be felt by your, your team? Um, and so one way that people have had success, they, they say, for example, right now it's July, you would say as of February 1 or January 1, we're going to move to a no accrual policy. Um, accruals are going to stop as of uh, October 1 and or some date that we're after. And then when people take time off, they're going to be pulling it down from the recruit time off. Um, so you can, low, you can make that bank smaller. And then you have to think about how you're going to do the transition. When, when the no accrual um, takes effect, you could either freeze those accounts and that's just money that's basically sitting there for when the employee separates. Okay, so that's a, 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 a non-funded, oh my gosh, I've lost my word, but you know, it's a it's a accrual that they have that you would have to pay out, or you could pay it out, or you could have different tiers where if you have more than 100 hours, then you're, you're gonna ease into this no accrual policy over eight months instead of six months. So all that has to, you have to look at your your um, your people and how they how much they've accrued, et cetera. So that's an important thing. Um, not to make a smart remark, but it failed. Um, you're going to want to have a, a written policy document that explains what the new rules, explains who is covered. Um, it, it, sometimes it can create a problem, again, because your non-exempts are not going to get this. Your exempts would get it. Um, and you really want to talk about what is, what's the goal with this program? That you want to explain that in that policy document. We want to encourage your freedom. We want to encourage your use of time off. We don't want to be having to track every time you leave for two hours early to go to a doctor, et cetera, because you're exempt. We shouldn't have to do that, right? That explaining what's going on. But, um, really the goal needs to be that we want to encourage you to, um, have the flexibility. Still do all your work, but have the flexibility. Um, you want to say, you want to make sure that everyone knows what their obligations is. This isn't a free for all. This is, if you meet your work obligations to the company and to your colleagues, you can't be that person. We don't want anybody here who's going to um, leave their, their colleagues high and dry, which <laughs> in and of itself is an interesting thing. You get that concept of, well, these people with their kids are getting every benefit and I'm not without realizing that the people with the kids might be staying up till 11 o'clock at night to finish their work. And this other person went home at five and had a drink and it was fantastic. And so um, making sure that people understand that it's a team and, and they're all working together. Um, in some of these documents, we talk about you need to talk to your team, um, of your colleagues and coworkers and say, I'm going to be gone for these dates. Can you handle this part? Can you handle this part? I'll be able to answer my own email or not. Um, and and to follow up on that and then the same thing comes back when the other people want to take time off <clears throat> then that would work as well um and so then just saying how that was you may take time off from work on regular business days as you wish with full pay so i just said something kind of that sparked something that usually sparks a question so i said i might i'm, I'm going to take time off and if you could make if, if this person calls can you handle it i'll be checking my email Okay, so if I'm an exempt employee and I'm getting paid for my time off, then it's fine that the person is checking their emails. It's also fine if 
for, you know, while someone's uh, down in Honduras hiking through the jungle, they could say, I'm not going to check my email. So I need you. I'm going to put an out of office on. I'm going to send it to you. And giving people that kind of control is important. Um, but they have to do it. They have to follow through on that or else this whole system collapses. Um, you want to have, so you want to have outlined that that burden is upon the employee to work with their team and their manager to consider calls, emails. And yes, I said emails. So if you're going to sit there and be like, oh, we don't use email. We use Slack. Well, the same thing, electronic communications um, and coverage for uh, projects, et cetera. And then you want to set forth in that written policy document how you want the employee to keep everybody informed. Um, sometimes we, um, it, it's a, it's an awkward, it can be an awkward um, language because we want the person to not necessarily request the time, but keep it, give everybody a heads up. And so sometimes that can be done through your HR information system. Sometimes that's email. Sometimes that's a whiteboard. It just depends. But you want to tell people how you want that to be done. Um, and then you want to have, and I can't emphasize this enough, you want this, you want people to have this freedom, but you want there to be a trigger so that you know if somebody has gone on into protected time off. So, because you don't want to mess with somebody who's on protected time off. So the key, um, and that has to be balanced with the concept that we don't want to have too many limits on this time off, because if you have limits, there's been some noise that, well, then you, when you say no accrual, that's a farce. It's kind of no accrual, but it's really a rolling four days at a time type of thing. And as plaintiff's attorneys, we're going to come in and say that that's just um, uh, a pretext. And in fact, you have this essentially an accrual program, but you're getting out of having to pay out as wages. So you need to have this balance. So the way that we've had success with that. Is, is language like this. Anytime you're away for more than five business days and have not requested time off per the program or have not notified your manager that you're walking across France or have not told somebody that you're going up to Sacramento to help your sick mom for a little bit, then because we have no idea if you're if you are partying or if you're trapped under a refrigerator and need FMLA assistance, you need to tell us. And we're going to assume after five days, if we have no idea what's going on, that you might need some protected time off. And so we're going to trigger that. So that really, we want to push people into telling us that it's, that they're going to be gone for a certain number of time, or we want them to tell us this isn't really this, this no accrual. This is a protected time off. You can still have ways to pay people on that protected time off. That doesn't mean it all has to go into the unpaid bucket, but we want to know if we need to issue the notices, if we need to consider this time protected, um, so that it's and it's for the employee's best interest so that they can't be like, well, we have a no accrual policy, but for the love of all things sacred, you were gone for 18 weeks and, you know, now you're, we're going to fire you. We, we want to make sure we have the protections in place. Um, we don't we want to talk to our um, managers so that even if they have that belief that we call it work for a reason and you got to show up and work, we want to make sure that they know what the policy means. And that that's our goal and our fun. And it doesn't matter what they their opinion is. In this way, we're going to we're going to promote this policy and want people to use it. We want them to know that privacy is important, but we still need that protected time off. Um, and we don't want it because a protected time off is protected. No accrual is no accrual, and they're very different things. We want people to who are managing it to be mindful and and how they're taking care of if there's a, a perceived abuses of the system. I think all of you who are listening to this might would would recognize a situation where someone says, well, Jake is totally abusing the system. And yeah, it's a no accrual policy, but he's always gone. Well, okay, well, how many, how much has he been gone? Well, over the past six months, he's been gone 25 hours. Okay. Has anyone else been gone 25 hours? Oh, well, yeah. And this guy's been gone 35 hours, but, but Jake is abusing the system. It's like, well, how it's, how would that happen? I don't understand because the math is that Jake's taken 25 hours and somebody else has taken 35 hours. What's your definition of abuse? And it really comes down to subjective issues that the manager is having. Um, you still need to have the tracking for San Francisco, even if you convert to this no accrual policy. Um, let's see. Uh, this is where I'm mentioning the, um, you need to be mindful that it's not a limit when we say the five consecutive business days or 10 consecutive business days. That doesn't mean that that's the maximum the person can take. That's just a, 
uh, a trigger that if you're going to be gone or you end up being gone that long, dear employee, we'd like you to check in with us so we know if we need to start a, a protected time off um, path. Um, if you're going to go from no accrual back to accrual, you still need a written document. That's the key to life right now. Um, sometimes in some areas we're saying, Maybe you don't want a written document about meal and rest breaks. Just put the poster up because everybody seems to want to revise the law and then that's how we get in trouble. But when it comes to this type of thing, you want to have a written document. Um, you want to have stated um, uh, what what the time off is, what the accrual rate is, that it accrues on hours actually worked so it doesn't accrue when, when somebody has a holiday, et cetera. The same basic rules you already know, you're going to put that back into place. You're going to track the use and you're going to pay it out at a separation. So, which is, and again, all of these things, are, you're going to follow all these rules. And it doesn't matter if it's accrual or non-accrual. It requires admin, and it requires, um, it requires mindfulness. And there's, we're now at the stage, given San Francisco's paid sick leave law, plus all the protected time off, that you can't, you can't let the the CEO or the president say, well, you know what we're going to do? We're going to go back to how it was when Fred Flintstone was in charge and there's nothing. You come to work and you work. That's not going to work anymore. Um, and so if that's, if, if the, if the CEO is moving into that because they don't want to pay for um, uh, this administrative work, that's very important. Um, it's it's going to come back to haunt them when people bring these very expensive claims or class actions. And so that's why it's important that you either monitor, you decide what you're going to do, and you set up your system, right, which is why so many of us, in addition to being nice, friendly people, so many of us go into HR because we can develop our systems and processes. You either do that or you get someone else on board. You get an HR consultant. You get somebody whose sole, or you just bring in a new employee whose sole goal is to track this type of thing and get your policies in place. So. I now, hopefully, that left enough time for questions, Amy. I kind of zoomed through at the end, um, but absolutely, Janine. I think um, <laughs> I'm still trying to think through some of the the situations that you explained because there's so many great specific <laughs> situations where I'm like, but what if? What if in this situation? We did have questions come in, so let's get started. Um, the first is it's a San Francisco company. And they have a flexible PTO program. Most of their employees are exempt. And um, their question was, do we still need to show the accrual and usage of sick leave, one hour for every 30 hours worked, in the wage statements? And I know that you, you touched upon that, um, but it's good to reiterate because that really gets down to the essence for a lot of people of what they need to do. Yes, so you do. Uh, San Francisco um, has specifically said um, that, and, and I even emailed them, and they have they sent me an email, and they said, yes, you must continue to attract to track the accrual based on hours worked, and you can do an assumption for your exempt workplace. I mean, your exempt workers, so you can assume a 40-hour week, so whatever that is, 1.33 hours per week, you would you would list as accrued. Now, um, it can since it's kind of a fiction, um, it's, I know it's difficult to pull down from the sick leave, but to the extent that you want to satisfy, you don't want San Francisco to come in the OLSE, the Office of Labor Standards Enforcement. You want to have it where you've tracked it, and yes, when someone has said they're sick, you're going to pull down from that time, even if you're going to give them even more time after they've exhausted that. Because what we don't like to do is, the, it, we don't want to have any low-hanging fruit, um, because then people get in and they start looking around and they see other issues. So yes, you, first of all, you must put the tracking on the pay stub. And second is my best practices is the pay stub. Yeah. And second, it would be good to do the, to pull down when people have used it. So, so it's not some fake thing. The policy would be that we're requiring employees to list sick time when they take it and letting them know we're not going to cap you unless you go into a protected leave. Well, if you want to say the answer succinctly, yes. <laughs> That's I mean, exactly you know, because right. it's the practical <laughs> side. We have to tell employees what we need them to do. So they are going to have to track it and then somehow word it, make sure that it's worded in a way that doesn't obligate us to more than what we want to say. But, but essentially <laughs> that, yes, it, you have unlimited, but I still need you to submit when you're going to be out for sick. Yes. Okay. Um. 
if you have an exempt employees on a no accrual policy and they change positions to non-exempt, do they start accrual from zero or do you calculate what accrual they would have had and use that as their beginning balance? Dang. You know, um, I, <laughs> I, the law would, I would say, without doing detailed research, because I, I can't imagine having seen it before, but you've changed positions, your comp plan has essentially changed, so now you would, now you would begin the accrual under the new rule. However, anytime we're moving people like that, it's usually because we've discovered that um, they were perhaps misclassified before. So the more we can make that a smooth transition without poking right. somebody, because it's, the it's employee. a, it's, yeah, it's an honor to be, some people see it as an honor, even though they're not getting overtime or meal and rest breaks, but still they think now they're being denigrated by going back down to non-exempt, even though they're not, it might be good to right. give them, to load their bank up. So legally, I'm, I, I can't say for sure that, that um, you could just start anew, but in terms of a best practice to avoid having to call your lawyer for another thing, you might want to do like a, sure. hey, already it, put money in your bank. Right. It may be the specific situation. We know a lot of people who move from exempt positions and then take on a more structured uh, non-exempt position because they want part-time, because they want, you know, for, for any yeah. any number of reasons, they might move to the non-exempt where it's not uh, cantankerous. And so they're... I, yeah, I think you'd have to look at it, right, to see, because if you've had no accrual, then, but, yeah, that, that really is tricky. <laughs> it is tricky, so, yeah, it definitely would depend. If the person's doing it because they want, I only want to work four hours, and I'm moving from this 90-hour-a-week job, and now I'm going to work four hours, and that's going to do everything, then, yeah, you would, it's basically as if you have a new employee coming in in some uh -huh. ways. But if it's and because you're trying to... scratch, yeah. Yeah, if you're trying to fix something then you may, you may want to give them something. Yes. And again, if you're in, um, you, would, you would need to start them when it comes to their California paid sick leave. You would need to load their bank because they've, they have accrued because they've been there that whole time. So that would be a very fact-specific question to ask Amy. Okay, <laughs> great. Yes, ask, ask Amy. Um, can we require people to draw down their PTO balance rather than paying it out when we move to, to a no accrual? Yes. And so that, again, these are all very fact specific and how it's going to work with your company. But that's why we give this really long notice time and we stop accruals at some point during that notice time. And then so people, so they're not, it doesn't just defeat itself, but we stop yes. accruals. And then as people take time off, because people are going to, you know, hopefully they've been taking time off and they're going to take time off then they're going to pull that down. And so long as you give advance notice and you don't, you're not forfeiting the, the amount they don't lose it then then that works so you could do either some companies right, want well, to just pay it all we out require, it. if we require them to use it before December 31st and they don't are we saying that we're okay not paying that out as the employer or because that was an accrued benefit by law that we need to pay it out anything that they don't end up using that's that's a great question sorry so if you said um, we're gonna you can either say you're gonna pull it down until it's all gone and even while other but the problem is, is that you have other people who just start and they can take time off and they didn't they're not pulling down from a bank so you have those morale issues but let's say some companies have just said as of december 31st we're it's all no accrual and so you could just take your time off either you would because you can't absorb you can't forfeit it you would either pay it out or you would just keep a record that that person has that money and then you could either do um you know, if they leave within the next six months, you'll pay it all out. Or you could just do, in six months, we're going to pay out a quarter of this. In six months, we're going to pay out another quarter so that you pull it down without affecting your cash flow. So there's different ways to, to accomplish that. And that's why you really need to look at, you know, are you like, like, are you Kaiser? And you have people sitting there with like 18 weeks of time off. You're not going to pay that all out unless you suddenly flush with cash. Okay. Um this next question is very interesting. Under a flexible plan, can we put limits on the consecutive usage allowance, like you mentioned, if you're not here for five days or whatnot? But so their question is, can we put limits on the consecutive usage allowance, for example, 15 days for folks who have been here for more than three years, 10 days for others? Um, and if so, 
if they do not want to take longer absences, can we treat such requests as partially paid and partially unpaid? Oof. Okay, well, the first part of it is a danger zone. So I, I might okay. even punt on the second part. But the first part, when yeah. you do that, when you're saying 15 days because you've been here for more than three years, that's where the courts, the plaintiff's attorneys, the labor commissioner is going to say that you're, it's not really a no accrual policy sure. because you have these time limits that aren't related okay. to – because the way we get around the, the five days is because it's not really five days. We, we want to know what's going on. But we really need to be mindful of the, all those different, you know, the, the 20 protected time off. But once you get into this, if you've been here this long, you get this much time. We're rewarding you for your longevity. Now you, you've slipped back over into an accrual policy, essentially. Okay. Even if, well, and so it's danger, danger. And that also answers the second part of the question because then the answer is no, and you can't treat some as paid and unpaid if, right. you know, based on your, on your first part of your answer. Okay. Um, uh, we have for many years and continue to give each employee three paid sick leave days per year. Do I understand it correctly that we can continue to do this and be compliant? Yes. <laughs> Although I hate answering yes. Um, I know without yes. knowing the specifics. <laughs> Yes. The California paid sick leave law requires that three, the 24 hour grant could be one way to comply with it. And so if you're doing that and you've always done it, you didn't really need to change it. You just need to make sure that um, you're tra you still have to do the tracking portion of the law. So you still need to have that where as of January 1, now it shows 24 hours on your pay stub or the document going with the pay stub. And then as they use it, it gets pulled down. And the three days concept it may need to be modified because, again, in, in, under the new law, people could take it in two-hour increments. So it's not really three. I mean, it's three days, but it's really 24 hours. So there's a little bit okay. of tweaking that might need to be done, even though you, I mean, on the face of it, if you walked up to me, I'd be like, yeah, you're great. But that's how, that's where trouble brews. Right. Hey, um, I think this is interesting. With our current PTO policy, employees can augment their disability with PTO while on maternity leave to get a full salary. If we move to the no accrual, how will this be affected? Will they still be able to augment their salary with a no accrual policy, question mark? Hmm. Generally, yes. In, I mean, if I'm listening correctly, the, the, um, that brings in a different issue. So you can have um, – you can create policies of, of paying people while they're on time off due to pregnancy issues. You can, you can have, we're going to pay you 68% or 100% or we're going to coordinate the benefits with SDI and, and paid family leave. You can still do that. You, you know, it's like, <laughs> as I was talking to my child this morning, listen to my words. You must also do it for your male employees. That you can't be a one. It can't be just for the women on maternity. It must also track for men taking time off to care for their kids. Um, and then you get into um, wanting. To, I, I, we feel that it's coming down the pike. That well, pregnancy and caring for your kids and, and augmenting that has its value. What about people who have, you know, they are ill? And so then you might want to think about how does that work with just your normal FMLA time off? So you, all those things are things to be considered, but you can do it. You just, if, if okay. you're going to do it for pregnancy, do it for men too. Okay, great. We have time for just one. Um, of course, it's, these answers can't always be quick, but one more, one more question, which is um, what is the best practice for handling FMLA and, and uh, short-term disability leaves in which there is a one week unpaid waiting period as well as the 12 weeks of unpaid in which the employee pays six, is getting 60% of their wages. So um, do we have to pay the remaining 40%? So it, it's, it's the follow-up to the question that you just answered, but just clarifying, are they required to pay their 40% because of the no, no accrual policy? Okay. 
No, so long as you make that clear in the policy. That's why the written policy right. is so important, that it's not intended to cover that. Um, this is intended, and that's why, and when you see the sample that Amy will provide to you, it talks about this is intended to cover short-term things. It's not intended to be for your full FMLA time off, and, but you need to make that clear. That's where if you just say, we have an unlimited policy, live and let live. Right. You don't have anything more than that. You're going to, you're going to owe for that whole, for the, six, for the 12 weeks or the pregnancy right. disability, the 16 weeks plus. So. The written policy is critical. Boom. Janine, you've answered so many questions, and yet so many remain for all of us <laughs> with, as we look at the specifics of our policies and our companies and whether we should do it or not. For more information, you'll have to follow up with Janine directly because we are out of time for today. Thank you, Janine, for your time and sharing you. your expertise. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. All right, and thank you all for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you online at future webinars. I'm going to send out um, a link to the, this recorded session so you can listen to it again. You can forward it on to other decision makers in your organization so you can look out for that email. Thank you for joining us today and have a great day. Bye-bye.